Hello and welcome to the fifth webinar in the Organic Seed Production 6 webinar series. Today's topic is seed cleaning and record keeping. This is your host, Alice Formiga, from the eOrganic Community of Practice at extension.org. This series of webinars is organized by the Organic Seed Alliance and the Multinational Exchange for Sustainable Agriculture. All the recordings from the series are available on the eOrganic YouTube channel and on the eExtension website at extension.org. Today's presentation will last about an hour, followed by about 30 minutes for questions. I'm very pleased to introduce today's presenters. We have Jared Zeistro and Lori McKenzie of the Organic Seed Alliance back with us, and they've done many of the other webinars in this series. And we also welcome a special guest, Rowan White of Sierra Seeds. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to our first presenter. Um, Jared will be speaking first, and Lori will be operating slides, and she'll come on right after that. Hi. So as uh, Alice said, I'm Jared Dexter with Organic Seed Alliance, and today we're going to be talking about seed cleaning. And this is a topic that I maybe, in my job at Organic Seed Alliance, get asked more about than just about any other. And one of the reasons for that is that if you're a commercial seed producer, um, seed cleaning is an extremely important part of your skill set. I would say that, um, to back up a little, if you're not producing seed to sell commercially, if you're producing seed for your own use, that sometimes the criteria and requirements for uh, how clean your seed is can, can really can vary and, and, and can be up to you. You may um, not need your seed to be very clean if it's for your own use, depending on if it's having to go through equipment or not. Um, but if you're in the business of producing seed, clean seed is really important and can often be a challenge. One of the things that I hear again and again with commercial seed growers that I work with is that the process of cleaning seed and the ability to clean seed efficiently and effectively can really be uh, a make or break difference in terms of whether a given seed crop is profitable for them or not. They may be able to have gotten the seed crop all the way through from planting through to harvest with relatively little labor, but then in, when challenges are encountered cleaning that seed, that can eat up an inordinate amount of time and um, potentially can um, even get to the point where if the seed is not cleanable within the set of skills and tools that they have, um, they may have to pay um, someone else to pay that the company they're contracting with. And so um, both in terms of labor and in terms of um, if you're having to outsource the cleaning of your seed, it can be a, a big expense and a big part of uh, whether or not you are profitable with a given seed crop. So understanding what tools are out there, what are some of the basic principles of seed cleaning is really going to make a big difference in, in your success. Um, in addition to the um, importance of getting your seed clean uh, efficiently and effectively um, in terms of expense, it also can be a big part of your reputation for um, many um, growers. When you think about selling your seed and the, someone receiving your seed, what they see and what they base their, you know, their understanding of your uh, quality as a seed grower on is, you know, the first impression that they're going to have is looking at your seed. They're going to look and see, well, is the seed um, high quality in terms of, you know, does it look like it's, uh, you know, mature seed that um, doesn't appear to be, you know, discolored from rain. But, but most importantly, often, you know, if there's uh, contamination in that, you know, if there's still chaff, still if there's dirt, if there's weed seeds in the seed that you're providing to your customers, whether that's a seed company that you're contracting with or um, farmers or 
gardeners who are buying seed from you, if they see those things, that's going to really be damaging to your reputation. On the other hand, if you're able to consistently provide very clean seed, that's going to help your reputation. Um, another reason that clean seed is really a, a key to success is that although you can uh, get by, like I said, uh, depending on if you're saving seed only for your own use or, or selling it, um, you may be able to um, replant seed without cleaning it. Having clean seed really increases the longevity of your of your seed because uh, seed in itself tends to be a very dense material that does not uh, very readily and rapidly absorb moisture. Um, however, the surrounding chaff, the stalks, the pieces of leaves, the flower parts, um, those can often very readily absorb moisture. They can also be carriers of any kind of superficial um, diseases that might have been present in the field. And so the um, presence, the more chaff that is around your seed, the more potential there is for disease to accumulate in storage and the less um, longevity you might see in your seed. So having clean seed going into storage will help your seed store for longer. So when you're thinking about seed cleaning, the first thing to do is to plan ahead. Seed uh, harvest and cleaning is often a big crunch time for seed growers where you have to turn around, get your crops out of the field and get the seeds clean and shipped to um, the seed company or to your customers. And at that point in time, what you'd like to have planned in advance is your, um, you know, the, the space that you're going to be operating your seed cleaning in, whether that's um, outdoors or you know, indoors, especially you know, in the, the face of inclement weather and in the um, you know, in this time of year, you'll want to make sure that you have the right tools and equipment already um, on hand, so that you're not having to um, make do with inferior tools, and you know, where again that can affect your both your your efficiency and the quality of, of your job, um, and uh, make sure that you have the necessary labor to be able to, to, to do it and make sure that the labor that you do have and the, the people that you have working with you know how to do a good job of, of cleaning seeds. So having all of that lined up in advance is, is, is really important. And this is Lori. I'm going to jump in and add to what Jared has already said and mention that um, in this picture you see a rubber made tote that's full of rough cleaned or uh, rough threshed seed and having a lot of rubber made totes on hand can be really helpful for moving seed around because when you got space in storage you need to not only consider where you're going to store clean seed once it's clean and dry and you're storing it for your own use or for shipping out at a later date but you want to think about where are you going to store things and where are you going to hold them while you're in the process of cleaning seed. So if you need to move seed from the greenhouse or from the field or from one location to another because of equipment or where you're going to clean, you need to think, do you have the spaces and the bins and the equipment to move that seed around in various stages? And also you're going to be drying the seed as you're cleaning it. So having areas where you can lay the seed out even once it's clean or if you rough the rest of it in the field, but you don't have time to do more cleaning on it, you have a space where it can hang out for a little while until you can get to it. We're going to, in, in this webinar today, we're going to be walking you through kind of step-by-step step what are the practices for cleaning seed. But before we do that, I want to just introduce a few basic principles that apply to um, so much of the crops that you're going to be working with and, and, and things to, to think about that are going to improve your success. So one of the things that I always found is that 
a, a big part of cleaning seed actually happens before you at, before you ever get to what we would consider cleaning, and and it happens by avoiding getting contaminants into your seed. It's often faster and easier to avoid getting things into your seed than it is to get them out again. And so, you know, some of the strategies there to avoid getting things like weed seed and dirt and extra chaff um, include, so prior to harvesting, for example, you, um, you know, having uh, relatively weed-free fields throughout the season is certainly a good thing, but definitely prior, prior to harvesting, especially if you're doing any kind of uh, mechanical harvesting, something where you're, you know, using a, a harvesting tool that's relatively indiscriminate. Um, walk through your field and, um, you know, do a final um, removal of any weeds that are going to seed in in your seed crop. So that way, when you're threshing, those weeds aren't there um, to shed their seeds and mix in with the seeds that you want. Um, likewise, in in terms of avoidance. Um, thinking about how to avoid getting dirt into your seed. Dirt's often a real challenge because uh, dirt clods can be various sizes, and those sizes can often be the same size as the seed that you're working with. And, and, and because seed cleaning, as we're going to point out uh, very soon, often relies on separating things based on the fact that seeds are a specific size and the fact that seeds are, are relatively dense. Um, dirt presents unique, unique problems that way because dirt is also dense and it can be, you know, almost identical in size to your seed. And so thinking about how do you keep dirt out of your seed, you know, part of that is thinking about care. If you're harvesting, um, uh, don't let the, you know, if you say you're harvesting onto a tarp, don't let dirt get onto that tarp while you're harvesting. Um, if you're um, you know, cutting plants, um, you know, cut them at the base rather than uprooting them. Um, things like that, you know, to, to avoid dirt is really helpful. Um, likewise, um, smart harvesting and um, timing of your your harvest um, can help avoid some extra chaff. So there's kind of a, you know, in each, each crop, um, in, you know, in each climate, you're, you're going to have to, to learn this for yourselves, but there's, there, there can be a fine balance between finding it, uh, you know, often throughout the day, there's there's sort of a, 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 you know, throughout the course of the season, as your seed is maturing the, and, and your plants are maturing, they begin to dry more and more and become more brittle and amenable to threshing. But within the course of a day, you also get a cycle where in the morning when the dew is still heaviest, you've got... Um, probably too much moisture to want to harvest, but um, at a certain sweet spot, you, you may have a lot of the, the actual, you know, condensation off of your, your plants, but um, they may be at a point where there, there's still a certain amount of suppleness to the, the dried plants where they'll thresh fairly readily without um, a lot of the um, stems and stalks and leaves um, breaking in the threshing process so that the seeds can escape from the, um, the um, plant without a lot of extra chaff um, coming along with it. So those are some strategies in terms of avoiding things ahead of time. Um, another general strategy is um, just thinking about seed um, cleaning, especially initially, is really a, a, a process of volume reduction. You know, you're starting out with potentially a lot of material that's a mix of what you want, which is the, the final seed, and, and a lot of what you don't want, you know, which is the chaff. And thinking about how do you, as rapidly as possible, eliminate a lot of what you don't want, and how do you do that in a way where you don't have to move around a lot of um, that chaff with you? So thinking about strategies that allow you to reduce volume in the field um, can save you um, time and it can also save you uh, that valuable space that you might need in, um, you know, especially indoors. Um, third point is thinking about um, avoiding it, 
kind of along the lines that sort of matches up with the um, avoiding cleaning things that you don't need to. Um, if you have multiple lots um, that are in your field or um, after you've harvested, so if there's a way that you can divide up your seed crop in a way that there, you, you know that part of your seed crop might be dirtier. So this can either be because, say, part of your field had more problems with um, weed, um, you know, weeds that set seed in this than another part. Or say, when you were um, uh, wind growing, meaning you know, when you cut your plants and allowed them to dry, and um, you maybe let them dry on, um, uh, you know, row cover or geotextile fabric to sort of finish up drying and and uh, and uh, you know, drop seed. You know, the seeds that that fell during the that drying process, there might be more contamination for the seeds that are on the ground cloth versus the ones that are still um, attached to the plants and that you thresh later. There might be a number of reasons why one subset of your um, seed crop is cleaner than another. Take advantage of that and keep those or treat them as separate what we call lots and that allows you to um, rather than if you mix them together, now you have to do intensive cleaning to the entirety of the seed crop. But if you intentionally separate subsets of your, your seed crop into ones that you know you're going to have to spend more time on because of more contamination issues and ones that you don't have to spend time on, that will save you um, effort. Um, uh, fourth point there, using tools that are appropriate for your scale. Um, we're going to be talking about a lot of equipment, and, and we'll be pointing this out, but something that's very important to know is that there are frequently trade-offs between the tool, you know, with, with each tool. And just because something is bigger or more expensive does not necessarily mean that it's better for what you're trying to do. Um, often larger pieces of equipment have more time that you have to invest cleaning out the piece of equipment. If you harvest with a combine, you may end up spending uh, you know, a day with an air compressor trying to clean out all the little nooks and crevices of that combine before you can harvest a different seed crop with it. You know, whereas if you had just harvested by hand, you have no downtime in, in, in um, cleaning out the equipment. So, Knowing you know the, the scale that you're working and choosing equipment that matches the job is, is important versus necessarily just trying to find the, the perfect piece of equipment that works for everything. Um, and finally, um, thinking about record, yeah, please jump in. Oh, this, oh, this is Rowan. I just want to um, mention that especially for seed farms that are diversified and have many different types of seed crops growing in smaller lots. If you rely on those labor-saving um, machines that um, you know have higher volume, you can oftentimes get into a bottleneck situation where uh, you're waiting on the piece of equipment in order to clean kind of the backlog of all the different lots of seed that you have to clean. Uh, so again, that's an important uh, thing to think about if you have diversity of different uh, smaller lots. Sometimes going lower tech is a, is a better is a better path and a better approach. So we'll we'll be talking. Um, Further on in the in the presentation about you know some of the different uh, scales that, that you can uh, scale tools that you can use. Yeah, um, and then uh, finally, one of the things that I've I've seen and again that, that seems to um, really uh, pay off in the long run for uh, experienced seed growers is. Is, is good record keeping. Um, so paying attention to how you clean a particular type of seed um, and recording that so that way last year or the next year that you do it, you don't need to do it again. And so part of this actually comes to also having kind of systematic processes. So um, using tools that allow you to take a record of it. So knowing, okay, well I you know use this particular tool and I, you know, use this um, you know, I, I was holding the seed this high up off of the fan, you know, and the fan setting was this. I had a screen that had, you know, this screen size, you know, all of those 
um, you know, tools that have, have settings on them um, or ways that you can sort of measure your methodology um, allows you to, to record your methodology and, and, and apply it again the next time you come on that crop. So I'm going to take over control from Jared. This is Lori. And you've noticed that Jared and Rowan and I are all contributing. And because we all have a lot of experience, we've all worked with a diversity of crops, we want to share all of our knowledge with you. So each of us are going to kind of contribute as we feel that we have something to share on each of these slides. So you'll hear us kind of jumping around with each other, um, all contributing to the next series of slides. And we're going to try and we may kind of whip through some of these quickly. We have a lot of photos to show you of different methods and tools. Um, but first, I just want to give you this slide as an overview. This is what you do when you clean seed. First, you thresh it. Threshing is the process of removing the seed from the plant. Then you clean it, generally through winnowing and screening. This is for dry seed. We are also going to go over wet seed. And then you dry it and you store it. It's a very simple and elegant process. So the first step is threshing. I just mentioned that's removing the seeds from the plant material. And these photos give you kind of an idea of uh, different scales. On the left, you see Michaela Crawley. She's our program director. And she's just threshing with her feet in a box. This is a very effective small-scale way to do it. On the right, you see Frank Martin. This is a belt thresher. Belt threshers come in all sizes. This is a medium size, I would say, and I believe he's threshing some sort of uh, brassica crop there. But the idea is those two belts um, circle around each other and pull the seed crop through and break up the material. The seed drop down on that deck that you see just beyond the the belt is a, has a mesh on it and seed drops through there and actually comes out the very bottom. You can see a little handle right in front of the wheel uh, to the left side. And there's, you pull that out and it's a big tray and that's where all your nice clean seed falls through. And the belts are adjustable both in speed and distance apart. So you can use it for a variety of crops. It works great when, it's, uh, when it stops working and gets stuck. You do have to do a fair amount of work to pull the belts and open them up and get whatever out is stuck. So as Rowan was mentioning, sometimes um, lower tech is actually more efficient and faster. I'm going to show you a series of um, threshing options. This is a small belt thresher. And these are fabulous. If you do small lots of things, they're fairly easy to clean. Belts are kind of the middle of this picture. I can show you pictures. my pointer. The belts are only this long. And then you're feeding the seed in here, and it's coming out. This is your chaff blowing out, and the seed actually comes over here on the other, the opposite side. Uh, it's a really nice piece of equipment. It's fairly expensive. I believe these are about $15,000 if you buy them new. There are also places that you can get equipment like this secondhand. Um, and uh, we've worked a lot with a place out in Illinois called Commodity Traders International. And if you talk with uh, auction houses, you can oftentimes find equipment like that secondhand. We uh, have a plot thresher that we got uh, for considerably less money than what you'd pay new. Uh, so uh, keep those resources in mind. Absolutely. Uh, this is a way we used to thresh seed at Wild Garden Seed. I used to work there a while ago. And uh, I'm sure they still do this. And if you're doing this, this is, again, another brassica seed crop. You lay it out on top and you drive over it. And it's actually a very effective, nice way to thresh seed. Um, you just want to be careful when you're doing this that you do it on uh, grass and not pavement. You can shatter. And Alice, for some reason, these are not advancing. Oh, there we go. OK. okay um, you can break seed. I think so. Okay. Uh, so if you have vulnerable seeds, especially bigger seeds like bean seeds, um, you can shatter and break them if you if you do something like this with a heavier piece of equipment for threshing on a hard surface. You never want to do this on concrete. Uh, here's some smaller, uh, very low tech and fairly low tech options. On the left, you have Frank Morton and a chipper shredder, which is a great way to break up material and we use that a lot, especially for chicory seed. 
I recommend if you do try that, if you have adjustments, turning the blades down or uh, turning the speed down or even I've heard of people wrapping the blades, if they're real sharp, wrapping the blades with duct tape so you're not uh, scarring and breaking up your seed. On the right is, uh, go ahead, Derek. Yeah, uh, regarding the chirper, chirper shredders, um, a lot of people that I've talked to have um, actually modified them by, if you see on the side, you can see kind of the, uh, there's the belt there that connects the mm -hmm. motor to the chipper shredder and it actually okay. modified the, um, the um, gearing of those to lower the RPMs. So yeah, we've done, we, aggressive. we've done that for ours because we've found that for larger seeded things, um, yeah, you get a lot of shattering if you have it at higher RPMs. So making uh, adjustments to those uh, pulleys and belts is pretty essential. And if at all, if you have a tinkerer in your community or somebody who can lay things up so you can have adjustable RPMs, uh, it's, it's super helpful. So. And then on the right, this is Sarah Klieger of Adaptive Seeds, and she's cleaning parsnips. And she is just she has a handful of seed stalks in each hand, and she's just rubbing them together. And you can also use a threshing stick um, to release the seeds. And this works really well, especially when the plants are nice and dry and crisp, like uh, Rowan and Jared were saying, the crunch time. Uh, you can actually get a lot of seed off in a short amount of time with hand labor. And then you can also do hand threshing and hand stripping. You can do this with screens. This is um, some sort of onion or allium crop. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but you can hand thresh over a screen like this. And this is doing a combination then of threshing and one of the steps in the cleaning process of screening, where as you're threshing, the seeds are actually falling through the screen and a lot of that chaff and, and sticks and stalks are staying on top. You can also hand strip things on stocks like spinach, beets, chard. Uh, it seems like it might take a lot of labor, but if you have, um, I would say, even a small to medium lot, and it won't take that much time, and you don't need to run out and find someone with a belt thresher, you can do a lot of that by hand. Uh, this is just a, like, one of the things that I've found and it's been a, a real pleasure working with seed growers is that kind of as Rowan mentioned there is you know a huge community of tinkerer and so many people have uh, invented tools to, to meet their tasks um, especially um, as you get to smaller scale you know, so, so often the equipment that exists out there is not really matched for small scale so this is a thresher that uh, Golden Rule Farm in Willis, California is um, made for, basically it's kind of a, uh, uh, you know, a, a very simple pressure here that you can just put the seed head in and then that um, rotating cylinder there will uh, brush it. If any of you have ever grown carrot seeds, you know, it can be a, a challenge and a task to deburr them, getting the little spikes off the seeds so they don't all stick together. And this was a uh, really easy and simple homemade tinkering solution that they came up with at Nash's Organic Produce, which is a fairly large farm here in the, on the Olympic Peninsula. And they grow large amounts of carrot seed, and they don't necessarily use this when they do large amounts. But if they have smaller lots of things that they're trying to clean, this was one way to come up with not replacing the sitting around and rubbing it all by hand, which you absolutely can do. I have done that with a lot of my small lots of carrot seed. Uh, we grow a lot of, a number of small lots of seed for our breeding work, and we do all of our carrot cleaning by hand, but we're not dealing with large volumes. So this is just a, a five-gallon bucket that you've, they've drilled in. You can see here on the side, these are drilled in from the outside of the bucket. You can see here they're attached. And this core in the center, this actually comes out. It's just rebar that's been um, welded together. And then you fill that up with seed. You put the lid on, and that uh, core bar sticks out through the top of the lid, and you attach it to a drill. And that drill then rotates that core around, and the bars 
go back here. So these bars go in between the ones sticking out from the side of the bucket. So it's like a, it's sort of smashing all the, the seed around. And you do that long enough, and the, uh, it will actually deburr the seeds for you. This is perhaps sort of one step beyond the threshing, and this is separating the chaff and the seeds once you have actually gotten the seeds to come out of the pods or off the plant. And this works well uh, with heavy seeds in particular, especially heavy seeds like brassicas that are born in bracts or um, heavy seeded crops like beans um, and peas born in pods. And what Don and his son are doing here is they're going along and they're fluffing up the top layer. And so they're, they're bringing all the chaff to the top and all the seeds are falling to the bottom and then you can just use those pitchforks and you can actually fork all that chaff off the top without losing any of your seed because once you've gone all around that pile and you'll feel from the beginning when the seed and the chaff is mixed up, there's a weight to it. You fluff everything up and the seed falls to the bottom, the chaff becomes much, much lighter. And this is a nice technique to do in a field before you move seed. They've obviously already moved the seed out of the field um, and they're in the barn area, but it, it's a nice technique so you're not moving a lot of mass from the field to wherever you're doing your cleaning. To note on this picture, uh, it's really important to protect your lungs when you're doing uh, this sort of work in the field. So we use uh, dust masks and bandanas and things because uh, over season after season of working with uh, the dry, dusty chaff, especially things like lettuce that have a lot of you know, fine um, fluff, uh, those can be very irritating to the, the respiratory tract. So it's really important to, to uh, yeah, take good, good care of your health. <laughs> and make sure your workers are doing that too. Mm -hmm. Then once you have done your threshing, you're going to move on to either screening or winnowing. And I, we're going to talk about screening first and then winnowing, but you can do them in whatever combination you want to, just because we're presenting screening first does not mean you have to do it first. Uh, screening is a process of separating your seed by size. And this allows you to remove larger chaff if you put chaff and seeds into a screen and the seed goes through and the chaff comes off the top, it's what we call top screening. And you can also do it the opposite way, which we refer to as bottom screening, where you're removing debris that are smaller than the seed. Those are falling through and run away and the seed that you're cleaning and, and intending to keep stays on the top of the screen. And one thing to note in this picture, the, or this slide, the top picture, you have a lot of seed cleaning equipment in your kitchen. Uh, your sieves, your bowls, and um, one thing I love about screening and seed cleaning is a lot of the screens and equipment that I use and I found most helpful are not specifically for seed cleaning. So I strongly encourage you to peruse your kitchen, your cabinets, and your garage, and your shop, and I guarantee you'll find things that you wouldn't have thought would be cleaning equipment that will become very useful. On the bottom, much larger scale, um, this is a screening, piece of large scale screening equipment has a method, and I think this one has possibly four, but four. only two. Yeah, and so the, the screens are taking stuff off the top and taking stuff off the bottom and then you're ending up with your nice clean seed at the end. These are oftentimes called a fanning mill too because oftentimes in those uh, machines they not only kind of gyrate the seed but there's also usually a, a, a fan blowing through that so you're getting both the screening and the winnowing done at once uh, which can be yeah. Yeah, uh, very helpful. A couple of, a couple of sort of general tips about screens. Uh, first is that the, obviously the size of the screen matters. So you, as Lori pointed out, you know you're looking for see you're you're looking for either a screen that allows your you know that, that's kind of the, the sm smallest size that allows your seed to pass through but keep the non-seed material, the chaff on top, or um, you know a, a screen that's just um, uh, 
small enough that it holds your feet on top but allows everything that's smaller than that to fall through. But as, as, as important as the, the size, often part of it is, is in sort of your technique and strategy. And, and I don't know, Flora, if you're going to, we're already planning on getting this, but I'll just mention it now. Um, some of the, the, the things to think about is um, it's often, you know, easier to, the less chaff that you have going into your screening process, the better. So, you know, using things like the, um, you know, the, the, the technique Lori showed with, uh, you know, removing some of that, that plus with, with pitchforks or um, I think we've got maybe some, some pictures, um, you know, just of removing lots of the, the chaff, which is often a process we call uh, scalping, where, where you're not necessarily trying to really do a, a fine job of cleaning this, but just trying to get enough chaff out of the mix that you're 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 dealing with mostly seed um, that allows you to do a better job of the screening. Also, uh, often you're looking to be applying a relatively fine layer of seed to a screen so that um, you can just um, sort of shake or tap your screen uh, long enough to allow the seed to fall through and then stop and let the Chaff stay on top. Um, so, so, so applying the fine layer, um, uh, using the screen only as long as you need to to get the seed to fall through, and then and then stopping. Um, some of those things help improve your efficiency when using screen. That's a great point, Jared. When I do workshops, I often tell people you want to stop shaking your screen right before you think you should, <laughs> and that's sort of a technique and a, um, a feeling that you learn the more you do it because you'll start to notice as you, right before you see the last of the seed going through the screen, kind of when you stop and let that seed fall through and then you're not shaking more chaff through and it's something you'll, you'll understand and build your experience. Uh, one of the things I want to show you in this slide or point out in this slide is I believe these might it be homemade screens. You can make a lot of seed cleaning equipment yourself. I much prefer to make my own seed cleaning screens when possible rather than buying them because then I can make them the size and the depth that I want in terms of the frame. Um, you'll notice this This is the top of the screen on this side. So you, these screens are fairly deep, which is really nice even when you're applying that fine layer. It just gives you a little more security. And I've noticed some of this, you'll see a picture on of some of the screens that you buy and like a seed cleaning set will not be as deep as these mm -hmm. are. And I would personally, if I were making my own screens, I would make them about twice the size. Uh, we work with another uh, staff member at OSA and he loves to work with huge screens. He likes his screens to be about three feet long. So it's, it's worthy of consideration, especially if you're going to be doing a fair amount of cleaning building and or finding screens the size that's comfortable for you ergonomically. Uh, similar to what Rowan was just saying with wearing masks when you're dealing with dust. If you're doing a lot of seed cleaning, you'll notice you'll, you'll start to feel it in your shoulders and your elbows and your wrists. So um, manage your, your screens and your equipment in such a way as to uh, reinforce good economics and, and good posture. Uh, Lori, if I could mention as well, we also uh, hand build our own screens. Uh, we've I found the best size for me is the size of like a square nursery flat, which is around 18 inches by 18 inches. Yep. And what we find is that they stack the nesting sets stack really well in one of those Rubbermaid totes. For cleaning seed out in the field, we can stack the screens into a Rubbermaid tote, uh, which comes in handy when you're moving uh, material around and so that's another concern is like how are you moving these sets of uh, screens around uh, when you're working with them. I do want to mention really quickly that a really great place to get high quality screening material uh, for building your own screen uh, sets. Uh, we've found a company that's based out of the Bay Area in California and they're, uh, it's called TWP uh, and they have stainless steel um, screen mesh uh, that comes from all varying um, gauges and such and so um, 
I would definitely check their website out. I'm sure there's others online, but they uh, have uh, good discounts on you know larger amounts. You can get a roll and split it between you and other farmers in your area and have a, a screen building workshop or something like that. So. And that also gives you the freedom to design screens that are going to work best for you. You can look at different size meshes. You can look at different shapes in the mesh and uh, really tailor your screens to what you're cleaning. Um, this is um, some field cleaning, field screening. This is a bulb crate, uh, which is not a seed cleaning tool, but is very handy. It's nice when you're doing rough cleaning in the field and you've got a lot of big chaff, like you've done that scalping off that uh, we showed and Jared mentioned of the bigger chaff, but you've still got a lot of mass to deal with. Having larger equipment like this or, or larger crates can be helpful for getting a lot of that big chaff off. And one thing I want to point out here, she's actually doing a combination of uh, kind of winnowing and screening. So if there were wind coming from this direction, you can't really see it. There's not a lot of wind because you see the chaff going straight down here. But here's her pile of seed that she's cleaning. She's built this sort of bridge in her tarp, so she's keeping her clean seed to one side and the seed that's about to be cleaned to another. And then if you orient this even further, if the edge of the tarp were right here, you could be winnowing chaff off as well. And that's one of my favorite things to do. Um, this is an example of a more of a fine screen. Um, this seed has obviously been mostly cleaned at this point. Uh, one thing to note here, though, is the screen is not deep at all. So you can really only put a very fine layer of screen on here. Working with screens like this makes me very nervous. I don't like to do it because I feel like if I lose my attention for a minute or I set it down and bobbles a little bit, I'm likely to lose the seed if it just toppled off the side. Um, and I don't, I don't like to take that risk. But this is an example of the finding a size screen. You can see through here, this is a very fine round mesh screen. And the, ch the small bit of dirt and chaff and uh, undesirable bits are falling through the screen and the clean seed is staying on top. Uh, if you do build your own screens, it's helpful. On this, I see there's kind of a crack between the screen and the framing material. What we've done on our screens is we put caulking around the edges so we don't get seeds trapped underneath the frame and the screen. Um, using a stiff bristle brush, like a steel brush, uh, to really clean the seed grains between lots of different kinds of seeds is, uh, is essential. So. And then well as cleaning your seeds, screening also allows you to sort by size. This is a, some sort of brassica lot, brassica seed that was grown by our friends over at Natchez. And this is just the larger seed, the medium seed, and the small seed. And it's not that any of the seeds necessarily um, more desirable or better, but it can be nice if you're using precision planting tools to have seed that's sized. Um, in this picture, this seed is probably less viable and less vigorous than this nice big seed here. So if you were, one thing you can do, um, if you're doing both seed for your own use and seed for commercial sale, you can do a sizing like this, or you can do the lots like Jared was talking about earlier. If you have a really clean lot and a less clean lot, you can sell into the commercial trade the nicer, uh, nicer seed and keep the smaller seed for your planting depending on what your, um, your equipment and your needs are. You can do the opposite. You can keep the really nice premium seed for your own planting and you can sell off the sort of medium grade seeds uh, as long as the, the germination and the weed seed is weed seed free and it's still a high quality seed. The, uh, real quickly, the other thing I point out about sizing your seed is sometimes it's helpful um, when, for example, you've got a crop and, and, and you know, Nebraska is maybe less of something, say, like beef or spinach, where you have a, you know, a pretty wide um, range in sizes, that can be hard to clean by uh, winnowing because you've got seeds that are really big and seeds that are really small. And in order to try and retain all of them, 
when you're winnowing, you end up not being able to be as aggressive in your winnowing. So if you separate them by size like this, it allows you to have kind of a, a, a tighter tolerance in your winnowing, and we'll get to that later. But that's another advantage or another reason you may end up on a side. Um, before we leave yeah, the screen, true. oh, sorry, this is Alice. I just wanted to say that we're getting a couple comments. Um, one person um, said that um, companies specializing in industrial filtering are often good resources for screens, meshes, and different gauges of wire and materials for screens. And um, then someone else wanted you to repeat the name of the Bay Area screen vendor that you mentioned. Oh, yes, it's TWP, and their website is twpinc.com. Thanks. Okay. Great. So I just wanted to show a few photos of some screening, uh, some field cleaning that I did this year. This is a purple-spreading broccoli crop. And uh, if you were in our last webinar, you may recognize this is geotextile fabric. It's a polyspun fabric that we use for a lot of field drying. So I've got my windrow here, and then I flipped those plants onto a tarp, which you see here. This is my threshing stick um, that I use to um, bang the plants off after I walk on them. So in this photo on the left here, I have walked on these plants and just sort of danced on them. And when I and then I picked each one off and kind of threw it into a pile over here using my threshing stick because I did that to thresh off any um, seeds that got missed when I stomped on them, and then that's what it looked like when I was done stomping on it. So I moved all of that into a pile, and the, uh, this is the, the sort of initial pile, and then I did that scalping, and I just did it by hand. Uh, that photo that we saw Don and his son using the pitchfork, you can also do that by hand. I didn't have a whole lot, so I did that by hand and threw off the top layer, and I used this as my bulb crate. Uh, we bought these from a tulip farm that's nearby where we are. Um, they're pretty inexpensive. I think they're about 2 or $3 each. They're invaluable um, to our operation, both for seed and, and carting things around in the field. Uh, so it's been extremely useful. So this is pretty much I went from this to this with one round through the screen doing that, what Jared was saying earlier, you only shake it until just a few times so you're getting the optimum amount of chaff off of each screening. And then I did one screening. This is, I believe, this is like a 16th inch screen. And I did one round through that, and I ended up with seed that looked like this. So that was really just two screenings in the field. And then instead of moving a whole bunch of material, I only had to move uh, you know, a tote full of this very nicely field cleaned seed. Uh, it took me about two hours, and I think I did between three and four hundred plants. So it was uh, got a lot. Ended up getting about 14, 14 or fifteen pounds of seed, and uh, it was very efficient to do it by hand. So the next cleaning process we're going to talk about is winnowing, and this is a process where you're separating by weight, and you're separating um, chaff, most generally chaff and clean seed. You can also, as Jared was mentioning, especially with um, kinopode seeds, you can size seed, but that's, uh, don't recommend doing that by winnowing. I recommend doing that by screening. And you can winnow either uh, by fan winnowing, like you see in these photos. Uh, you can also winnow outside a photo of that coming up next. But a few things to point out here. A number of farmers that we work with do a double fan arrangement, and that just sort of increases the consistency of the airflow and gives you a little more <clears throat> um, a better, better channel of airflow and uh, makes your winnowing more effective and, and easier. And Another thing to point out, these fans are actually working in opposite directions. So these double fans here are, are pushing the chaff away from them or on the right. So there's a different situation with the single fans, but kind of uh, the same idea of using a box 
uh, just a cardboard box to sort of channel that airflow. In this situation, the air is actually at the top, and the air are being sucked backwards. Both of them work. Uh, I've used both of them. You can try and try them both and see which arrangement you like better if you're um, curious. The, the real quick couple of points I didn't as far as kind of strategies around here is uh, the way one of the ways to winnow um, kind of as efficiently and quickly as you can is um, as Lori pointed out, having really consistent uh, airflow. So that's part of the appeal of, of doing it, you know, indoors, having these kind of guards, as you can see, around the sides of the box on the right. Um, the more consistent that airstream is, um, what what your real aim here, at least when I'm doing it, is I want to have a, a, a consistent sign sheet of seeds falling down, and I want to try and push that sheet of seeds as close to the edge of my bin as I can. That mm -hmm. way, as much chaff yep. is falling um, on the other side of the bin as possible. And in order to do that, having seeds that are as close to you know possible and, and um, as close to each other in size as possible, having the air that they're um, either getting pushed by or pulled by be as consistent across the full sheet as possible, and then having it go out in this thin sheet. So you can see in this picture there's a, uh, you know, that um, the person on, on the right is using a flat bottomed uh, little, like a wet white tub. And the reason that they're using that flat bottom is then you've got more or less an even amount of seeds pouring out from that whole flat bottom. And that allows, you know, rather than kind of having a thick lump of seeds in the middle and finer amounts on the side, you've got, you know, seeds that are more or less experiencing the same amount of wind force across the whole sheet. And that allows you to you know, get really close to the, the edge of that bin. Yeah, square. Uh, if you can find square five-gallon buckets or four-gallon, oftentimes they are from, um, you know, community kitchens or commercial kitchens. You can see on the left that's a mig biome there. And what I love about this picture is that he has a little piece of metal or cardboard that's uh, in between the two bins there too. So that's, um, you know, making sure that um, no seeds are kind of falling in between the two two bins there. But he would be better served by using a flat. Uh, a bucket or a vessel that was not round, that would be flat, more like the, the white container on, on the other side. And this, in this picture on the, the right, you get a good uh, visual of it. You're trying to have your seed, your nice clean seed fall generally right here, either hitting the back of your bin. This is a short bin, so um, in this situation, you're trying to just hit this very back seam, and that's, uh, it's uh, a nice visual representation of what both Jared and Rowan were just saying, trying to get your seed as far to the back of the bucket as you can so that you're um, losing as much chaff as possible. And it's just a nice up-close view of that. And this is an up-close view of what Rowan was just saying and pointing out is having this nice uh, sort of bridge here in between the two buckets that not only keeps seed from falling down, in between your buckets and getting lost, but it also gives you uh, a little bit more of that sort of backdrop where you're catching your clean seed. And uh, I also want to point out, I generally do not do this, but I've also had um, a, a lot of winnowing experience. One reason to do this is if you are new to winnowing or, or not terribly comfortable and confident in it, there are a few things you can do. One, if you get too far back or outside and you have a wind gust and you lose some of your nice clean seed and it goes into the second bucket, you can re-winnow it and you can recapture that seed. And as you winnow, you can move your whatever your vessel is, whether it's a white container or uh, I use a lot of con my reusable kitchens for using leftover food, make great scoopers for cleaning seed and you can as you're learning, you can you know, start by dumping your seed and having it fall forward in the bucket. You are going to get a lot more chaff in that bucket, but you can just keep winnowing. You're not going to lose the good seed. And as you get more confident, you can work back towards the back of the bucket. You, know, you won't be as uh, efficient or you won't get as much clean seed in the, in the bucket if you're 
scoring towards the front, but it can be a nice way to start learning and building your confidence. And this is my preferred method of winnowing. I prefer to winnow outside. This is how I was taught. And uh, one thing that I really love about winnowing outside is you get the full use of your drop. So when you've got a fan, you only have you know, sort of the, the flow window that the, the fan is giving you, whether you're using a double fan or a box to orient your wind channel, you only have as much space as the fan will put out. Whereas if you're, this entire drop is useful to you. And if it's very windy, uh, this Mary, if it's really windy, Mary's hand, she would drop her seed bucket, her, her container here, closer to the bucket. So she's not losing or her seed's not as vulnerable uh, to a strong wind. She can also move this bucket, her, her seed drop bucket forward, so towards the front of her bin down here, and the and still get a, a larger drop by doing that if the wind increases or if there's a gust that comes up. So I prefer the, the sensory experience, and I, I find it to be more efficient to winnow outside if possible. This is Andrew's gel of adaptive seeds, and he will do a combination winnow and screening. Here his scan is not actually operational, but um, you can do a combination like this just in your your inside seed cleaning setup. My apologies, it's, it's taking a moment for the, seed, the slides to advance, so that's what the dramatic pause is for here. As you can see, he's a fine connoisseur of all kinds of uh, vessels, like five-gallon buckets <laughs> and things. Oftentimes, most seed people will have a section of their farm or their home that looks like that behind Andrew. <laughs> yep. And the more you do it, the more um, strange and eccentric things you'll find that make <laughs> your seed cleaning life easier and more fun. Um, now we're going to move on to some larger scale equipment that you might encounter or be using if you're doing large scale amount of seed production. This is a gravity table and it works on density. So the seed goes in a hopper up here on the top, comes out here on the deck. The deck, deck has a nap to it and the deck can both be adjusted this way and this way. So you adjust the deck, the deck is shaking when you turn it on and the clean seed actually migrates uphill and the less dense uh, potentially Either smaller or immature seeds will stay towards the bottom of the deck, and then you can use these are actually pieces of cardboard that have been attached to these uh, to help orient the seed as it's coming off, and then you can orient it in three different buckets. And there are multiple scales of this. This is the gravity table with the deck full of spinach seed. And you can see this is the nicest coming off here to the left. And on the right, you have the lighter seed and the chaff, and this is us trying to figure out how we were going to, how to set the deck and how to orient these. It does uh, take a bit of finessing and knowing your equipment to find the right setting. And as Jared was mentioning earlier, it's nice to write the settings down when you find them so you're not reinventing the wheel every year. And you can get tabletop uh, uh, gravity tables, they're quite expensive, but I've heard they can be quite amazing to work with. Um, Jared, do you want to talk about this one? I, know, I think this is one of your photos. Rowan, can I punt it to you? You've probably had the most experience okay. using these. Absolutely. Um, so this is um, an aspirator, or sometimes people call them an air column. Um, they come in different uh, iterations. I know that I think there's another slide on here where there's a do-it-yourself and a homemade version. There was a YouTube video of somebody who had created that. Um, essentially what this is working on, um, mine looks a lot different from this. It has like more of a um, kind of a plexiglass column. Um, but the idea is that uh, the seeds get put into this and um, and you know, the, the seed, in the, the air flow that goes okay. through an aspirator is the seed kind of hovers in the air and then um, you know, the chaff gets kind of blown into some of the different pockets, so it's moving. It's, again, it's the same process of winnowing. It separates the seed and the chaff based on air blowing through. Um, and so some work on air blowing through, like a squirrel cage motor is the one that I have. It has a, a motor that runs up through. 
um, some work on sucking, you know, pulling using a shop back. I think this one uh, uses the shop back as the means to move air through. And you can see that this one has uh, a number of settings so you can adjust the airflow. Um, so many fanning mills and different um, uh, aspirators, you can really finely adjust uh, the amount of air that's going through. And that, that really comes in handy when, you're, uh, when you have different uh, density of seeds. So if you have very small seed, again, you only want a very small amount of air moving through those machines. Um, and uh, I'd like to mention that these, uh, the air column, uh, this particular type is probably one of our useful, most useful machines in our operation for doing that last 5 to 10 percent of what we would call polishing the seed. So um, it's pretty um, efficient and quick to get your seed to about 80 to 90 percent clean. And you're going to spend a large majority of your time trying to get that last 10 percent of your seed cleaned. And so having a machine like this where it's really finely tuned and you can allow just a little amount of air in there to really uh, separate out the the seed and the chaff that is almost identical in density and size. So um, our air column machine is indispensable to us, and we use it. We run almost every single lot of seed through that. So I would definitely uh, look into getting um, some sort of setup if you're doing uh, larger amounts of seed for sale for uh, com commercial production. I do want to make a plug that there is a company that's uh, located in Oregon. They're called Hoffman Manufacturing. Again, that's Hoffman Manufacturing, and they make the plexiglass tubes um, custom made uh, so that you all use this each motor and create a frame and a base for it. So uh, they're a really great uh, company to work with. They specialize a lot in seed cleaning screens and, and different equipment. So um, yeah, again, an indispensable uh, piece of equipment in my eye. And this is the homemade version. You can find plans for this online if you're interested in making one yourself. As Ron said, this, you attach a shop back up here. So as it's pulling the air, you put your seed in here. The clean seed will work its way down this zigzag tube and come straight out the bottom. And the chaff will get pulled off um, as you adjust your airflow and will come out down here on the right uh, bottom side of that separator. So that's it for uh, dry seed. Now we're going to zip through some wet seed extraction. I, I know we're cutting into our Q&A, um, so we'll try and be quick about this. Um, this is the melon seed extraction. One thing I want to point out, this is a paint stirrer attached to a drill, and that's what they're using here to break up the, um, the flesh and the seeds to help with cleaning and extraction. Um, you can do this on small scales in um, mason jars. We used a lot of quart mason jars and, and half gallon mason jars to do our tomato seeds this year. This is tomato seed fermentation. And this is tomato seed fermentation uh, on the left. And uh, peppers, maybe this is peppers. Actually, I think this is tomato seed fermentation on the left and peppers on the right. But this is the idea. You can, uh, if you have larger scales, you can ferment in larger vessels, such as trash cans. And you just want to ferment for about three to four days, uh, around 70, 70 to 80 degrees is fairly ideal. Uh, you may start to see this mold growing on the top. That is OK. And it's not a terrible thing at all. And then once the uh, fermentation has been complete, you just decant. So you pour water into uh, whatever vessel you're using, whether it's a, a mason jar or, or a trash can, and then you pour it off. And pour it off, and then you keep refilling it and pouring it off and refilling and pouring it off until you're left with nice, clean seeds. And you pour that out through a, a sieve or some sort of um, catchment, and then dry it. That's the general process. And for um, fermenting seeds, and please do have more questions, uh, but I am going to speed us through the rest of this so we can get through some slides and still have time for questions. Um, Alice, I'm going to turn control over to Jared here and let him go through uh, the next series of slides. OK. So um, while, while um, I'm getting control, um, just real quick as far as wet seed process um, is a little different than dry seed. So uh, typically with wet seed, you know, 
something that's called a wet season crop, usually because you're using water somewhere in the, the cleaning process. Um, usually you're kind of working with fruiting crops and working with, um, you know, one fruit at a time often. So whether you're talking about tomatoes or peppers or um, squash or cucumbers or melons, you're, you're, you know, the initial thing that you're doing, you're in some way um, kind of threshing the, the, the crop by, you know, splitting open the fruit, pumping the seeds out, or just breaking the um, fruit up into pieces so that the seeds are free. Um, often when you first get the seeds, they're still stuck um, uh, to some of the placental tissue. And so the fermentation process where you add um, either seeds to just ferment them in their pulp or add water is done um, for tomatoes and cucumbers is done in part to remove the mucilaginous gel that's around them, but for many other of the crops, a, a, a shorter fermentation process is something that might just be a day or two days is used just to help to dissolve some of the placental tissue. Um, some of you know, you think about you know the strings on you know pumpkins um, that just allow it to get dissolved a little and soften up and, and allow you to clean it more easily. So this is an example of how Bill Reynolds, a seed grower that grows a lot of wet seed crops, processes some of his. Um, uh, this is a zucchini seed crop, so all he does is he starts by um, splitting the zucchini, just using this maul, um, and then um, after they're split, um, he scoops them out, and so I'm gonna, I, I, I clipped it, but we'll see. Um, I, haven't, I haven't tried yet to see how fast things advance, so um, I'm, I'm waiting to make sure that I don't overclick and go too far, but I'll try clicking one more time. Um, there we go. So then the, you know, after he um, flips them, he actually uses uh, this little uh, bar here, um, just a, um, you know, a, a, you know, a, I'm blanking on the name of the seed. There we go, pipe strap. Uh, to, to scoop the seeds from the inside of the zucchini out and then they're falling down into a bucket. Um, and then in the, once they're in the bucket, um, just like that earlier picture that we saw, he uses a paint mixer bit on a drill to mix them up. Um, here's um, how he processes winter squash using an axe head and just splitting them um, against it and then scooping. You know, again, after those get um, split, then they're going into a bucket getting stirred, and then they get briefly fermented. Um, this is a um, vine thresher. This is a, a, a piece of equipment that basically has a um, some, uh, a threshing um, head in the front of it that will break up some of the fruits. So in this case, I think we have delicata squash, but it can be used with lots of different fruits. And then it has sort of this big tumbling uh, perforated screen here that then the, the seeds fall through the screen and the uh, rest of the fruit will fall out through the front. And then once you've um, fermented it, uh, you can rinse and decant as Lori had mentioned, um, not method for separating the seed after it's fermented is a sluice. So the idea with the sluice is that it has a long, you know, it's a box that has a long run, um, a relatively gentle run, and there's a number of small wooden baffles along the bottom of it, and you pour the seed in through the top and add uh, water gently, and what will happen is the seed the heavy seed will get stuck behind the baffles that are along the run of the um, seed sluice, and then light seed, the pulp, and water will flow over the baffle. And then after all you have left is, um, you know, after sort of gently rinsing water over it, all you'll have left is the heavy seed that's caught behind the baffles, and you can rinse it out more aggressively by sort of just using a hose like Bill's doing here. Um, it's faster than the rinsing and decanting often, but it definitely does use a lot of water. So if you're in a place where water is 
that's an issue that's something to be aware of. So here you can see how the feed is getting caught behind those baffles. Um, and then um, typically uh, for many wet seeded crops, they will, um, after the, um, after you've uh, done the wet seeded process, you're still, you're, you need to dry these seeds and um, then and you'll probably want to dry them quickly because they're full of water um, and they're ready to germinate and so you can you know, spread them out on screens in a thin layer, stirring them, applying airflow. Bill will actually initially, with his zucchini seed, will actually initially throw it in a, a dryer to um, get some of the moisture off and then spread them out thinly on um, um, on screens to dry, and then um, and then once they're dry, I'm often still going through a uh, a screening and winnowing process, or at least a winnowing process, because there still might be some material attached to them. This is um, peppers, but same basic process um, with with the peppers. Um, another tool that can be used for um, peppers. It can also be used for tomatoes. Um, for cucumbers, is something called a wet millet wet seed separator. And the way this tool works is there's a, um, a, 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 a threshing head that does it that breaks up the fruit and then it falls down here and then there's this angled screen with um, sprayers that will blast water and push the seed through the screen and then the, the, the seed will be caught and the pulp will fall past the screen. Here you can see um, usually you end up using a hose to um, help the sprayers. The way that Bill does it, at least if he has it going directly from the millet then on into his sluice um, like that. So here you can see, you know, the seed is still not fully clean, and at this point, that's when you'd want to um, get that seed dry and then um, go through a, a cleaning process, a dry, you know, the, the, the dry seed cleaning process. So I put this in. This is an example of using a wet process for a dry, clean seed. Uh, this is onion seed, and oftentimes you'll get to this point of cleaning it your feed and you just can't get those little breath out anymore. They're um, just sort of impossible. They're about the same size and the same weight. You can't screen them and you can't winnow them, but you can slope them. And Jerry, you can just flip through the next just one or two slides pretty quickly. It's the same process um, of decanting. So you add water to the seed and then you just the uh, uh, those bracts will float up and you just decant them off. So this is Michaela and Beth uh, of Canyon Bounty Seeds in Idaho. And because it's a dry seeded crop, you want to do this fairly quickly and then it's important to get them laid out and dried. And you want to dry them quickly but not too quickly. Uh, because if they dry too quickly, you can actually get the outside dry and then the inside of the seed, if it has soaked all the way in, um, will stay wet and then the seed will um, potentially rot from the inside. Yeah, we've used this method before and it works great for all alliums. Um, uh, definitely the slide before showed fans that were blowing over those seeds. I would definitely recommend that, especially if you're in a climate that has more humidity. Um, so definitely getting that airflow over the seeds. Well, I'm not sure in this talk how much we want to cover the um, germination test thing. Um, yeah, just I, I just given put that it, we're out of time. Yeah, I just put it in here as kind of a reminder that it's a good thing to do, and it's fairly easy to do with German paper or um, like paper towels. But certainly before you send it off, sell it, and also for your own use really helpful to know what kind of germination rates you have and you can increase your germination rates by doing more cleaning. And yeah, I would like to, uh, uh, I'd like to mention that. 
Yeah, I would like to mention that as a, somebody who does uh, commercial contracts. We oftentimes do a germination test when we think it's as clean as we want to, as we want to get it. And if we need to increase uh, the germination percentage, we can run it through a whole other set of winnowing because those seeds that are maybe less developed and are bringing your germination percentage down can oftentimes, with a rigorous uh, second cleaning, can be rogued off the, off the top and, and, and you can greatly increase your germination percentage uh, by doing so. So it's definitely a wonderful um, litmus test uh, throughout your germination or throughout your clean, seed cleaning process to, to do that, especially if you are uh, sending the seeds off to fulfill a commercial contract. So when you're storing your seeds, it's ideal to have them in a cool, dry, and dark location. Uh, it's often hard to combine all of those things. Um, but one of the most important pieces of seed storage is having a minimum fluctuation of your conditions. So even if it's not super dark and it's not um, you know, ideally cool and dry, it's much better if it's consistent conditions than if you have a lot of fluctuations. The seeds are alive and they are respiring and as they get warmer and wetter, they get more excited and they breathe more and they use up more of their energy. So you want the idea of keeping it cool and dry and dark is to minimize that respiration and using up of the seeds resources. And a quick way to think of that is if your relative humidity and your air temperature combined together should be 100 or less. So if you have a closet in your house and your house is generally 70 degrees, as long as your seed is, as long as your humidity is 30% or lower, uh, your seeds will, will most likely be fine. Uh, it is, I think it is ideal to have your seeds in airtight containers if possible. Um, they need to be very dry, very in your airtight containers. If they are still moist and you put them in airtight containers, um, they can rot and um, essentially compost in there if they have too much moisture. So you can put desiccants in with them. You can actually buy desiccants. You can buy desiccant beads that will change colors and give you an immediate visual indication of um, whether it's dry or not. You can also put rice in or uh, use other very low-tech solutions that you see on the left. Here we've got a, a photo of glass jars. These would be considered airtight. Um, and then on the right down here you have some sacks on the bottom. These are definitely more breathable. And the more breathable the, the container is, the more responsive those seeds are going to be to the environment and any changes in the environment. And of course you want to protect them from pests. Um, I know this is an underground seed storage here in the middle. I, I don't know too much about it, Jared. Or that's that's from my farm actually. <laughs> this oh, is that's at, your farm. <laughs> yeah. So this is at our place, and we built a a large uh, cob uh, adobe structure to house our seeds. And so we have an underground portion, which keeps it cool, dark, and dry. Uh, where we live in the Sierra foothills, it's uh, oftentimes exceeding 100 degrees in the middle of summer, and so. We like to have a place where we can keep the seeds nice and cool, and especially not dependent upon electricity, because we also get blackouts in the summer. Um, so we uh, use the thermal mass of the earth. So we have an underground storage that's got an o overground component that's made of, uh, yeah, cob. Okay. So I know we ran over a little, but uh, got a little more time left for questions. So Alice, if you want to yeah. take control. Yeah, we um, we can continue a, lot, a little longer um, for questions because I know there have been a lot of people um, in the queue here. Um, I know um, one person um, wanted to know if you have any thoughts on screen material, whether you should use aluminum, stainless steel, brass, galvanized steel, what works best or what doesn't. I mean, I've used, uh, if you can afford it, using something like stainless steel, uh, it, it tends to... Uh, um, have a longer lifespan, uh, but I've also used galvanized hardware cloth uh, in, in in many situations that have worked. Um, I've also used different forms of, of steel that uh, the the clipper fanning mills that we have uh, that have these uh, they not only have uh, different 
uh, gauges, uh, threads per inch, but they also have different shape holes. Uh, you saw a couple of slides there where there were some that were really round. You can get them uh, triangular, sometimes oblong, uh, to really maximize the uh, the separation of different chaff and seed material. Um, so you can find some of that punched screen material uh, from places like Hoffman Manufacturing and uh, through uh, places like Seed Burrow is another uh, outlet online that sells seed cleaning equipment. You can get some of that uh, material that is uh, shaped and punched into different um, shapes like triangles and such. Um, so I, my experience has been mostly with galvanized uh, metal and stainless steel, uh, but uh, does anybody, uh, Jared or Lori, do you have anything to comment? Uh, my feeling is that the shape and size of the holes in the material is more important than what it's made of. I've used a number of different materials and, and haven't really noticed any differences. Right. Okay. Um, a couple slides back. Um, someone wanted to know whether that was a tumble dryer. Um, also, um, someone else, speaking of tumble dryers, um, had commented that you can defuzz tomato seeds by placing the seeds in an old nylon hose, leaving room for them to move around, and then put that in a tumbler or home dryer set to tumble and no heat with a few tennis balls. Um, do you have any comments on dryers? Yeah, so that was a that was a, 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 a tumble dryer. That's what um, Bill Reynolds, the seed grower, does to get the initial moisture off of his um, zucchini seeds after they've been wet processed. We just want to make sure to note that that dryer does no longer have a heat element in it, so that's been disengaged. So you want to make sure yep. if you're using a dryer that it's not actually has it doesn't actually producing heat because. We don't want to heat seeds above 100 degrees, uh, ideally. Um, that can uh, kill the seeds and decrease the germination percentage. So, um, I I've also seen people use, in a tumbler situation, using a, a concrete mixer, you know, one of the smaller mixers. You can put seeds inside of there to deburr and put bouncy balls inside there and use that as well. So, um, that's another kind of uh, farm uh, seed farmer hack uh, that I've seen. <laughs> Okay, yeah, someone else commented that tomato seed dried too fast, particularly in the sun, can tend to crack the seed coat. Um, yeah, we've done a lot of tomato seed production uh, at our farm, and we've done a lot of small lots this year, and we've been drying ours. We have a propagation house into a shade house and just threw a shade cloth over it, and we've been drying them in there and making sure that we're keeping the temperature ideally around 90 or below. Uh, so if you have structures, like greenhouse structures, that you can turn into um, drying facilities and put some sort of shade cloth or, or mud or something on them to shade them out a little bit, that could be a great place to dry things down. And generally, you want to avoid drying things in the direct sun. And if mm -hmm. you are drying them in the direct sun, you want to be turning them frequently and not leaving them in the sun for very long because you don't want to expose them to too high of heat and you don't want them to dry really, really fast. Okay, um, here's an interesting question. Um, what to do with low grade, shrunken, split, or light, etc. seed? My clipper fanning mill often sorts off 50% of my heirloom wheat into the second shoot. Should I replant it for my own use or just use it as livestock feed? Any suggestions? I think all of the above would work. Uh, we oftentimes see that we have, uh, you know, a number. You know, we're not going to get 100% you know harvest of our seed. Um, you know, we've. Uh, I know that some outlets have used it as you know livestock feed or um, have you have sold lower grades of seed to things like. Um, I know, if, uh, Lori, maybe you can speak to some of the mixes that Frank has put together, like the critter mixes that you know he's sold mm -hmm. to. Maybe to seed out into your, um, you know, pastures or your, to your free-range chickens, things like that. That um, uh, that might be another use for that. Or do you have any ideas or yeah? Thoughts on no, that? I I, yeah. I I agree with all those thoughts. Two things I would consider is if your clipper is cleaning off that much of your seed, that makes me suspicious about the clipper and whether that's um, serving you 
as well as you want it to. If, if it's cleaning off good seed in that 50%, I would look at modifying it or changing screens if you can or changing airflow. Um, I would be hesitant to replant what it's cleaning off if replanting it for, um, you know, production or seed saving because ideally you don't want you, you're not it's not your your most robust uh, vigorous probably healthy seed and if you're trying to cultivate seed saving for a number of years going forward that's not going to be the best seed for doing that um, but I would think yeah doing using it as livestock seed or planting it and grazing animals on it if that's an option or putting it into some sort of uh, mixture or um, hedges or biodiversity or animal feed sounds good. Um, he said the issue is seed size. Number one seed is at least 50%, but the clipper takes out of a lot of smaller fractions. Thank you, he said. Um, uh, OK. OK. Um, let's see. Are there specific temperature, um, maximum temperatures for certain varieties, for example, um, legumes for drying them? As a general rule, I try never to dry anything over 90 degrees. Um, I, I don't know that there's temperatures that are super crop specific. Um, and the, the worry with using high temperatures is drying too fast, especially with things like lentils where you can get a really hard seed coat. And if you dry fast, you can dry out that uh, fast and hot you can dry that seed coat out too fast and it'll get really hard and retain too much moisture inside the seed. Um, Roland or Jared, do you have anything to add? Uh, I think that's it's pretty straightforward. I, I also don't know crop specific uh, temperatures, but again, you know, slow and steady and keeping things below 100 degrees uh, Fahrenheit um, is typically the best and out of the... Okay. Um, let's see, for very small seeded tomatoes, um, for example, current tomatoes and some hybrid lines and cherries, um, a uh, person has commented that they use a food processor with a plastic bread kneading blade and pulse it until it makes a slurry and breaks up most of the skin, which will later float off after fermenting and rinsing. Yeah, yeah, that works really wonderful. Uh, we've used a lot of kitchen grade uh, equipment in our seed barn. We've actually used a number of um, old food processors that we've gotten at thrift stores and old blenders to, to do things like tomatillos. Um, a lot of our, like we do some herb seeds like ashwagandha and uh, ground cherries and things like that where we will make kind of like a smoothie, a seed smoothie and do the fermentation and decanting in that way. What I found to be helpful is that um, we often can dip the blade um, in uh, some of that meringue goop. It's like a, it's like a shoe goo uh, to kind of uh, dull the sharpness of the blade so you're not getting the uh, nicks on the seed coat, which can uh, decrease the longevity uh, and the vitality of the seed. So you can just take uh, unscrew the blender at the bottom or take the food processor um, blade unit and just dip it in the marine shoe goop. Uh, and it just kind of coats it with that kind of rubbery plastic, um, so you're still getting the maceration, but not the uh, yeah, not the nicks and cuts on the seed coat. Okay, we've got Ben from Real Seeds on, um, who shared his um, zigzag cleaner open source plans, which I put in the um, chat box there. Thank you very much, Ben. And he also um, said that for small tomato lots, they use a particular electrical assembly glove for defuzzing. It's called the White Showa 370 Assembly Grip nitrile coating glove goodness okay is a very lightweight but tacky glove and <laughs> works well for small medium sized lots so thanks for that great um well, let's thank see you for sharing um yeah someone um wants to know whether peppers what okay it says peppers are considered wet seed but is it necessary to ferment all wet wet seed uh, no uh, no yeah it's yeah. Go ahead, Lori. And you, you can actually process peppers as either wet or dry. Uh, I've done both. When I first started working with pepper seeds, we processed them dry. And we would just 
cut them open and essentially rub that the seed core on the screen and rub the seeds off and then dry them and winnow them and screen them. Um, you can I've been told that fermenting them pepper seeds does not really uh, benefit them so much because they don't have that placental tissue. It's really the um, tomatoes and, and, cu and cucumbers that really need fermentation. As Jared mentioned earlier, you can do that kind of short fermentation for a couple hours or a day just to break up the, um, the flesh and the fibers and make it easier to separate from the seeds. But um, the seeds don't gain any benefit in that case from peppers that they do um, with cucumbers and tomatoes. OK. Um, and we, I, sorry. Excuse me if I'm repeating. I don't know if we mentioned earlier, but that placental tissue around the tomato and the cucumber seeds has anti-germination compounds in it, which is why you have to get it off when you're cleaning the seed. If you just let the seeds dry with that gel tissue on it, um, you'll have a, a very major decrease in, in your germination. Okay. Um, someone asked whether vacuum sealing is a good idea for storage. I've never heard anyone um, doing it. I I don't see why it wouldn't be if your seed was dry enough. Yeah, I I, I definitely yeah. I mean, that's that's actually pretty common when you're talking about long-term storage of seeds, like in seed banks and things like that. And like I said, the the, the trick is just that you want to make sure that your seed is dry enough going into it. OK. Um, do you have any suggestions for any type of treatment to kill bugs in seed stored in drums? I'm pretty sure we're talking about grain seed here um, that would be permissible in organic farming. The, 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 yeah, the, the storage uh, pest insects are, yeah, are often problematic. Um, the, you know, some of, so uh, some of the things, a lot of them are, are most problematic at higher humidities. So having your seed staying dry it helps to begin with. If you're dealing with small or lots of seeds, the drums is you know tough. Um, if you're dealing with small or lots of seed, um, you can kill off a lot of those insects by freezing. Um, you need to freeze it for long enough um, because some of them are pretty um, uh, robust to, to freezing. So either you're going to bring your seeds down to actually zero degrees Fahrenheit um, for you know a week, or if you've only got a freezer that can get down to 32, you might be wanting to freeze your seeds for you know two months or more. Um, again, that's not super helpful um, for seed uh, stored in drums. Um, I'm not a you know I, I can't speak in terms of OMRI certification. Um, you know, I, 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 I believe that um, you know, people have used diatomaceous earth. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure, but uh, you know, check with your certifier, as they say. OK, thank you. Um, let's see, last question here. Um, this, OK, um, can you talk a little bit more about um, the relationship between the size of the seed and viability and whether it also relates to the size of the plants. I know in the last webinar we talked about that a little bit, but um, if you'd like to talk a little more about that, that would be helpful. So, um, so, so, so large seed doesn't necessarily, um, you know, to a point. So, so your smallest, your, so your small seed often is going to be the seed that is, you know, especially in a kind of indeterminate plant where the you know, seed is flowering. Um, you know, the, the flowers continue to appear throughout the season. The later flowers tend to produce the smaller seed, and also the seed that just has a little less vigor and viability. When you're, when you're, so, the, so the smallest seeds can often have a lower germination and, and, and lower seedling vigor when they do germinate. When you're talking between kind of medium and large seeds, you may not a huge difference in germination. Um, seed um, weight um, and density is often, you know, can be a better indicator. So that you know that your lighter seed is, you know, tends to be less likely to germinate. None of those things necessarily are 
um, you know, genetically going to affect the size of your plants the next year. But if you do have um, seeds that are, um, you know, on that sort of extra small size or on, you know, the light side where they are capable of germinating but they um, have relatively little stored um, carbohydrate in them to um, then those seedlings will have less vigor and in turn they probably are going to be a little slower growing and stay, you know, behind the curve. Okay, great. Um, we have a final comment here. Um, if you're in a damp climate for long-term storage of very dry seed, um, we found that even thick polyethylene bags are not very waterproof. It's better to use ones with a foil layer in them like coffee is sold in. Yeah, so that, that would be what we'd call mylar. Uh, uh, we use that a lot for our long-term storage of our seeds, especially the ones that go down into our deep freeze. Uh, so that eliminates uh, that penetrating moisture as well as, um, you know, some of the freezer burn or some of that other um, things that happen with seeds that are in long-term storage. Uh, those are available through companies like Uline and, you know, there's several online sources. We just uh, do a quick heat seal on the top and uh, they're a wonderful um, alternative for longer-term storage. We find they hold up much better uh, than, you know, kind of your Ziploc bag or any kind of plastic uh, bag in that in that regard. Okay, well we're running out of time, but I'd like to thank everyone who participated by asking questions and sharing your own experience. Um, thank you so much, Jared, Lori, and Rowan for sharing your knowledge of seed cleaning with us. And uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. I'd also like to say that we have a final webinar in this series, which is coming up on the third Tuesday of next month. So you don't need to register again, and we hope you can join us for that.